Hello, all you vital, relevant ladies and some gentlemen. Welcome to the manse and to Homemakers Broadcast. And please click the link in the description if you're following this on the YouTube channel because you won't have to listen to the ads or click off the ads. If you'll go to the page on which I have embedded this and the link is there, just go there, go to the page. It'll show you some of the other things that I spoke of and maybe some extra pictures and some links that I might have mentioned. So now that you're all here, what is the first thing we do? We get dressed, we get ready, get bathed and dressed. And I have been talking quite a bit about two major things. And one is young single girls at home. And the other one is uh, clothing. And someone was gracious enough to send me a book here called The Lost Art of Dress. Dress meaning dressing, The Lost Art of Dress. So Karen, thank you so much. This has really given me a lot of content. And so I will be using that. And before we get started, I have my tea and today is called Stress Soother. It's by Traditional Medicinals. I really am enjoying this brand, Traditional Medicinals, because you can get them at any grocery store. And this is called Cinnamon Stress, Stress Soother. We're trying to find a substitute for the word stress so that we don't have to listen to it because just saying it can cause a, an a cortisol attack. So I wanted you to see this and enjoy it. Even if I don't drink it, I'll put it in the, uh, the hot water and let it sit there and it'll make the room smell lovely. So I wanted to share that with you today. And also, because I'm going to be talking about dress, I wanted to remind you about this book. It was called The Book of Looks by Lorraine Johnson. And it gives you kind of a theme of dressing. Uh, and you can pick out a, a look that you like and then expand on it with the style and colors. Like there was one here called the, was it the Scots Woman? Yeah, the Scots Woman. And it, you can, if you like the look, now I wanted to tell you about plaid and plaid skirts and plaid blouses. A lot of people don't think they look good on women, but perhaps it is because of what they wear with it. With plaid, white lace always looks wonderful, plus roses. So with plaid also, the softness comes from what you wear with it. And there's also many others in here that I like, and if you could get a copy of this, I'll give you some ideas. Some of them are not really sound, you know, wearing a sound judgment, they have some rather clownish looking stuff, but they have the Gibson girl and other things. And this will help you when you go along in this book, The Lost Art of Dress to show. And you could write, you could write your own, get a little notebook and write your own stuff in it and your own looks that you like. I probably could do that, but, uh, and I've started pages that I'd put in my notebook until today to go along with we have wives and daughters, and I have been talking a lot about the video. I do have the book here and can read some for you, but I've been talking a lot about the video, and so sometimes I'll watch it just to look at the clothing, and there is a website that you can go to. I'll put the link there for you on the page, and it shows the similarity to Molly, of Molly's clothes to actual museum displays of clothing and how close they were. So what I did is I have made a little planning sheet, the wives and daughters sewing sheet, and I have copied, as I've watched through, copied some of the dresses that I liked. And what I'll do is just take a plain pattern like this one and just add uh, some sleeves. For instance, if I make a long sleeve, ladies, I'll just uh, tie it in little bunches here and there just like this. Or I'll add a piece of white lace here or something like that. And so I wanted to show it to you, and I will be sure that I put a picture on the page for you to look at that. But if you don't sew, you can at least draw the pictures and then try to match it up with things that you can buy commercially. For instance, this lovely green dress. All you would need was a green skirt, maybe a t-shirt, 
and uh, you know some a lace shawl. You can just uh, imitate most of these. Now this one here, she had a blue dress on that had a, a white collar over it that was rather long. And uh, so I cut a piece of fabric here to go with it and tried to make that look similar. Now she also, on the first scene, Molly was wearing this little white dress to that party that she was invited to when she was about 10 years old. So I drew that. And I can still I can still make that, but I can use this, a very plain pattern. It's the fabric and the print that matters. And so this one was the little plaid dress she bought at Miss Rose's. Remember, Papa said it was quite outlandish. <laughs> and Mrs. Uh, and I had actually don't have yards and yards of this fabric, but I have little scraps, and I actually had a scrap of plaid here. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Hamley said that's a very unusual. Uh, dress you have there is it a tartan of your family <laughs> and she got it at Miss Rose's so now I have this one here which I just love this this is the little black the little dress she wore that had uh, black floral all over it and it had a white background and one of those white collars I'm wondering if she wore the same collar with different dresses and there I just happen to have a little scrap of fabric that's just like that now this was her light green dress that looks kind of velvety in my opinion and I believe it was in the first scene or second scene and I did have a piece of fabric to go with that and a piece of, you can't see it on this paper but there's a piece of the eyelet cotton lace and then over here this was the thing that my grandsons noticed the most when we went through the wives and daughters video they always commented on Lady Harriet's uh, writing outfit and thought that was real interesting. Remember, it looks kind of military-like, and it's kind of, uh, what would you say, Caucasian, uh, like up there in the Caucasus where all the castles are and the beautiful horses, and that's what her, when you go through that, try to find her on the horse, Lady Harriet. I didn't get her hat, but uh, I do actually have a pattern for one of those little coats. I might give it a try. And then this was the first dress that she's seen in after the party when she was 10 years old that skips over to the next scene of her being 17. And this is the similar print to that. I always loved that. And then this is the one where she was at a some kind of formal thing and it had it was a white dress with some kind of embroidery on the tops of the sleeves and right around here. This is the yellow dress that I love the most when she was in the carriage on the way to her father's wedding and it was a yellow dress with a white collar and a beautiful sage green shawl so I put those two pieces of fabric there with it. Now if I were going to make something and I needed to have I would put these like this is on a card I would put these all on cards and stick the card in my purse if I was going to go and match it up with shoes or with hair, like a hairband or something like that. So I will give you, I will let you see that online and let me see what happened to the other, what happened to the other thing that I had here. Hmm. Well, I was going to remind you, what I did with it, with the, of the Christian Charm course because they, here it is. It always, uh, go ahead and buy the older copy, which is red like this, or it's bright pink, and go to the sections where it talks about dressing, because even before this book was written, there were, there were uh, instructions and things that you could use, like this one was how to flatter my figure, and it was different kinds of dresses in here, or clothes, uh, are you tall? Are you short? Are you thin? Are you heavy at the hips? Uh, and just different different figures, you know, how to dress. And it was yes and no, like they'd have two costumes and it would be yes or no. And then this one right here is, to, these were for girls while they were still living at home. And how can I look well dressed? You know, buy one of these for you. Buy the teacher's manual. 
because it includes the student manual or by the student manual and teacher manual and homeschool yourself and go through this in case you missed it. Um, and I'm going to order a teacher's manual if I can find it. But how can I look well dressed? Uh, basic styles are long lasting. Fads come and go. And remember, fad means for a day. You really have to watch uh, the, some of the crazier styles. And it says that you can take basics and tune them up with belts and scarves and some of the current fads in those things that you, they're not permanent. Sewing saves money. You can adjust your hems. And then it talks about how to become color wise. And it says here uh, how to wear intense colors in small doses, having only one vivid color at a time, neutral colors for basic clothes, and bright colors for accents. Then it's talking about matching, mix and match with skill. That does take some skill with the uh, skirts and blouses. And that is where I think we've missed uh, several generations of training in this and some of the stuff people throw together because they weren't taught how to bring out, for instance, if you had a blouse like this, you'd wear a skirt the color, uh, this darker color here, uh, and it would look very coordinated. So then it was, uh, I dress with simplicity, and it has a picture here of a girl with uh, that looks fairly put together and then the other one has everything on. She's got a tie, she's got a scarf, she's got a necklace, she's got a handbag on her shoulder. She has several other bangles and things like that and uh, it's just yes or no. And then how to dress appropriately for the right occasion. Dressy times, church, and every day uh, right there. I think that you would help it. It would be very helpful if you got it for yourself. It also puts a spiritual accent on it, uh, which you might want to take that and look that over. That's really, really good. And then here's some more grooming tips. Uh, how to hang hang up your stuff, how to uh, how to iron your, your stuff. And also it talked about not letting straps show. Well, when did that come into vogue where straps, it's okay to show straps? Well, they started making clothes that actually deliberately had straps on them on purpose. Um, and it doesn't leave anything uh, private, does it? It doesn't say, I'm, I've got something special and it's private. <laughs> well, also, this reminded me because it showed this girl from the back with a wrinkly skirt. Always, we were taught, weren't you, vital ladies taught? Don't leave your a room until you've looked in the mirror at what you look from behind. Because that's what most people are going to see. And do you want to be embarrassed? Well, today, if you ask somebody that, well, they don't care. They don't care. They just like to be natural. They don't care if they're embarrassed. But it's not good for, for dignity, and it's not good for glorifying God and reflecting the beautiful creation. Now this is another page that was called Am I Well Groomed? And it showed a girl that was a picture of someone who was well groomed and someone who was wearing the same outfit but not carefully. It's uh, it's called Miss Well Groomed and then the other one was Miss Careless. And it has a little checklist here. And uh, although she's wearing the same outfit, she's not really carefully, it's not being carefully done. So then it talks about how you have to have a daily checklist mirror test here. Uh, full length mirror check checklist. Check front and back views. Skirt wrinkled, seams crooked, slip dangling. Nobody wears slips anymore. They don't even know what they are. Uh, hose wrinkled. By the way, if you have trouble finding slips, you can get the little, what they call the peasant skirts with the tiered uh, gathers and ruffles. You can wear, get a thin one from one of these discount stores and you can just wear them under a dress. They're quite charming if you get them in colors uh, and they match the dress you're wearing. Zipper uh, hose wrinkled, zipper unzipped, belt twisted, skirt off center, strap showing, lining sagging, seams popped, rips or tears, spots or stains, rips or tears. That's interesting. They're in style now. 
So, you know, what harm would it do for us to wear our old cotton dresses somewhere that are not they're not any worse than what people are wearing that are already torn. Spots or stains. I used to buy this grandma's stain remover. You can get it at the Hobby Lobby and other places that have sewing supplies. But then I looked online, and you can do this too, of how to make a solution. You save the bottle and you can make your own uh, stain remover with common things you have around the house or you can get at the dollar store. Uh, loose buttons, lint, or hairs. Uh, and here's a, a daily plan ahead checklist. Have you ever thought about this? Do I know what I will wear in the morning? Remember when, uh, you vital, wonderful vital ladies, you didn't go to bed unless you knew, and you could pillow your head without any kind of uh, thought of having to plan. You knew what you were going to wear the next day. Do I know what I will wear in the morning? Have I chosen coordinating separates? Have I laid out my accessories, my shoes, my handbag, any other things like scarves? Have I laid out fresh? Uh, have I laid out a fresh underwear? Is the slip the right style and length for my dress? And then they have a personal grooming chart. What I suggest you do is just copy it on your copy machine. Put it in your notebook and check it off every day. And they have, uh, you know, shower, wash face, brush teeth, um, daily look in the mirror, uh, look both front and back, and at night, uh, wash face, bath, brush hair, air clothes, and plan a head check. And it's very personal, but you can follow this or make up your own. And then it gets into more of a spiritual thing, like I check on my spiritual grooming. That's your, your attitude and your habits. And uh, so it's all connected spiritually. And uh, so even though this is a very old book, and I believe it was in the 60s that I first became acquainted with it, and I think I was only 16 at the time. Uh, but then my daughter grew up with it and uh, benefited greatly. And the coordinating book is Man in Demand, and it does the same thing for young men. And a lot of times the young men and the boys get left out because we take time to train the girls, and somehow boys are supposed to be just more natural or something. But it has a, such a good message in there and even has a lesson on clothing and, uh, you know, how, how to dress with respect. And uh, so... Let's go on then to this book here. Let's see, I want to apologize to everybody for not keeping up with correspondence, not sending out the things that I'm supposed to send out, but I'm getting closer to it, getting a little more uh, caught up with things. We've had a lot of things going on, and it seems harder to get here. And I wanted to show you when I made this, I just used the, uh, the sticky tape that is on both sides. What is that called? Um, it's the two-way tape to tape in everything. And then I colored it with uh, ordinary wax crayons, which is what I like best. So I will catch up. I've got your addresses. I've saved everything. I'm going to try to send something out soon. And um, I will assure you it will be before next year. <laughs> okay. So now I've been reading from Occasions, The Duty and Pleasure of Dress. And this is on page uh, 106 and 107. And it talked about these women that called themselves the dress doctors or people that were experts in dressing. And they would write for the newspapers or they'd write for the ladies' magazines. And they would ha have classes. Most of the Christian colleges in the day, before they were called universities, had lessons on how to dress, especially since they were uh, attended by Christian girls whose parents had paid to send to these colleges, and they were told how to dress for church and for home. And this lady has such a good point about home, so may I read it? She says, a rest may add to that happiness in a way that immaculately ordered room may not. Talked about women who need to rest and not have to work herself to the bone and how important 
dressing was for the, uh, for the star and the mood of the day. Not all homemakers took advantage of these perky cotton dresses. It was not uncommon, by the way, this is on page 107, it was not uncommon for women to make a charming appearance in public, explained one dress doctor, yet become frumps in the privacy of their own homes. You know what? We were warned about that. We used to have ladies' Bible classes back in the olden days, even back in the 1950s, and we were warned about this. Uh, and the ladies' Bible classes were interesting because they would come to each other's home. And although we couldn't attend all of them, we knew when it was our turn and we'd have them in our home. And they would, they would advise things like, don't let yourself go. I don't know how many of you remember that phrase, don't let yourself And they were particularly talking to women who, young women and girls who would one day be married. And they'll talk about how you're dressing up to impress the, um, someone that you hope to marry or that you're engaged to. But then when they get married, they just let themselves go. They don't care anymore. And so let us read about this. It was not uncommon for women to make a charming appearance in public, explained one dress doctor, yet become frumps in the privacy of their own homes. The dress doctors could not stomach the ill-dressed homemaker. And that's why I say uh, for all you uh, vital homemakers, especially, and you young ones, give homemaking a good name. How many times are you going to be seen in your local grocery stores and your post office and your bank and everything? Be sure to have a good appearance. A lot of those people that work there have to wear just really frumpy uniforms. It's not They don't even look fresh and crisp. I'm sure they're all made out of polyester, but they don't look... Um, they just don't look very happy, and the uniforms don't. Your clothing at home can express that freshness, crispness, and happiness, and that could be why I like cottons so much. They are crisp, and they, they do seem new. The dress doctors could not stomach the ill-dressed homemaker. You know, that's interesting that they could understand maybe on the street people not dressing very well, but the homemaker has every advantage. She, she has the time, and she is not in a rush to go somewhere. It was bad enough when a woman turned her hand to housework in a skirt from a worn-out suit and a stained blouse, and even worse if she chose to don a ruined party dress in apparently common practice. Yes, they thought that, well... I'm not going to be uh, wearing this again, or I'm not going to work outside the home, so I'll just wear this in the home. But they are not suitable for the home. You have to have clothing that works for you for the home. The life of an evening gown might be cut tragically short by a single encounter with a greasy food, but not proper economy to wear it while scrubbing the floor. And this is the thing that uh, the sarcastic generation went on and on uh, several times when I was uh, asked to present a lesson on clothing for young girls. They would mock it and say, I guess I'll just have to wear my prom dress, you know. But apparently that was an attitude years ago, back in the 1930s. They would take a formal dress and, and uh, wear it to death at home, um, which it really did not uh, stand up to the rigors of home. Dory Smedley, who authored a dress book for middle-aged women after undergoing her famous makeover in 1939, explained that such a habit only got worse. The woman who shambled around in ragged slippers, stockings with runs, a tattered dress, an old golf sweater, and straggling hair was likely to get into the general habit of carelessness. It was thought that if a person, if a lady dressed carelessly, that she treated her relationships carelessly, that she also would treat her economy uh, carelessly and her house and her possessions carelessly. And, and it does bear out that way. I can understand, you know, if you've had a sick day or a few sick days or, or there's been, um, you know, electricity's been off or something. I, I can understand that. But we were expected to recover after a while and 
dress up and dress up for the home. Stop making an effort to dress well at home and soon a woman will find herself out doing errands looking like a bag lady. That was written in 1939. Now what has happened? They're starting to hang out at home in their pajamas or their sleepwear or whatever and of course the stores don't help. They're selling cheap t-shirts and leggings and that's what the women are wearing and it says if you stop making an effort to dress while at home soon a woman will find herself out outside doing errands looking like a bag lady and it took hardly any time at all wearing worn out party shoes for housework was another misdirected economy Smedley thought it was the greatest cause of foot problems for women she recommended that home women buy what she called occupational shoes, sturdy numbers of soft leather that covered most of the foot and had a short broad heel. Now you remember soft leather meant no rubbing or blisters and you remember the Victorian boot, uh, that white Victorian boot that you see in pictures, it was black in the winter and white in the summer. Though That was made of kid skin, that was a soft looking boot. Everything in the Victorian clothing looked really starched and laced up and formal and stiff, but it really wasn't. It was all natural fabrics. And I think a lot of foot problems come from these synthetics that are in our footwear. So if you can't get uh, really good footwear then that is made of good fabrics, you can wear, you can buy canvas shoes and you can buy cotton socks. Now, if you wear a dress that's long enough that goes down to your ankles, nobody's really going to notice what kind of shoes you have. Uh, soft leather meant no rubbing or blisters. A mostly covered foot meant more protection from accidents or spills. And a shorter heel meant less strain. Yes, and I really believe wear the ankle uh, covered little uh, boots or shoes that cover the ankles because you never know when you're going to drop something, especially in the kitchen. For heaven's sake, Smedley warned, do not be seduced by images from Hollywood movies and don mules trimmed in marabou feathers unless there is a maid to do the actual housework while the lady of the house drapes herself across her chaise lounge in leisure. Otherwise, you are likely to trip and break your neck while trying to look picturesque while working. But we can still look pretty. We don't have to wear the uh, thick, soled, huge uh, sports shoes. You don't have to do that. Uh, those are rather heavy to lift your feet with, too. Just as bad was the effect that sloppy habits had on married life. How can a woman hope to keep the joyful respect and admiration of her loved one Mary Brooks Pickin fretted if she allows herself to generate into frowsiness, to wear curl papers, caps, and mussy negligees all day long. Maybe Pickin was unnerved by how much the frowsy housewife resembled a bleary-eyed lady of the evening, shambling around in the morning after a night. Or maybe she was dismayed that such a woman was willing to put the opinions of the stranger she met in public, for whom she would bother to get dressed, above the feelings of her nearest and dearest for whom she would not. This is what I'm trying to say here, that your home life is way above public life, and we should dress better for home, and we should be more polite at home, and we should be more intelligent at home, and we should be more respectful at home than anywhere else. Unfortunately, it's gotten to where it's just the opposite. People come home, they shut down, and they let loose uh, like a Pandora's box of everything that is unedifying. And always remember, we are here as homemakers to edify, to build up, and to improve the mind. Uh, and anything we do and say is for others' benefit and for their improvement. Helen Hall, a businesswoman who ran a correspondence sewing course, Correspondent sewing course. That's interesting. Hmm. Wish I'd get a hold of that, see what they did. And lectured at department stores from coast to coast, hinted darkly in 1931 at what might happen to the homemaker who neglected her appearance. We were always being warned when 
back in the day, weren't we? Not to let yourself go and be careful what you're wearing. Because you will move differently in a dress than you do in uh, sports clothes. It was a wiser choice in the long run, she explained, to spend a bit more of your husband's paycheck to buy a nicer dress. Otherwise, he might compare you unfavorably with the uh, younger women that he met through business. Now, see, that was something that we were made really aware of, is that the husbands were going to see women at work, or in the, even if they're not working, they would be customers, and they would be able to see these so that the wife at home needed to dress the best she absolutely could and, and to learn about it. That's why I suggested that Christian Charm Course has a lot of good ideas and the man to man. There was no word on what happens to the happy home if the husband lets himself get frowsy. <laughs> the dress doctors lavished unusual attention on outfits for sports. Partly it was because they were happy that the young women of the 20th century could launch themselves into a number of healthy activities. Uh, but even the sports outfits, they had to be careful. So let me read an example here. When they first took up croquet and skating in the 1850s, athletic women simply hiked up the floor length skirts. Women turned to tennis in the 1880s. But when a young American woman named Mae Sutton appeared at Wimbledon in 1905, her opponents complained that her skirt was short enough to expose her ankles, to say nothing of her short sleeved blouse. Sutton lengthened her skirt, then took the women's title anyway. So she was just showing you can, you can win a sport like that, and it was um, croquet and skating. Bicycling and golfing became the rage in the 1890s, and bicycling to the golf course combined the two. The bigger innovation here was that knickers were worn under a slightly shorter skirt. Now, they have some beautiful uh, fashion plates in this book that I love. In the middle, they have she has a whole bunch of colored pictures of these fashion plates. And that's what, uh, I will take this one pattern and kind of look at this and just go with the color and the trim. It doesn't have to actually have all the same pieces or the same kind of sleep. It's something that is, I call this literature-inspired uh, clothing. Literature-inspired clothing, whereas previously when I made up one of these planning sheets, it was artist-inspired clothing. And I chose a couple of artists one of them uh, was Edmund B. Layton. Now, some of you remember what I said about him, uh, that he, his wife apparently, now this was found, I think, in his diaries or his wife's diaries or some report. I'm not sure that it would be true, but it seemed to make sense. Um, he was a very precise painter and had apparently been, had studied architecture. So he painted like an architect, but he had a lot of beautiful, Victorian style women in his paintings and his wife had apparently sewn a big life-size doll for a model for him and then he would just put different clothes on it so he wouldn't have to deal with a model. I thought that was really clever. That's why we have our dress forms, isn't it? So I'm trying to get to the part where that she talks about knees, but I'm not sure that she had anything like that. So let me um, read some more about dresses. For women who worked as maids and wore uniforms or other plain and practical clothing during the day, changing for the evening was a special pleasure. I would always go to work neat and clean, recalled one woman decades later, but my dress-up clothes, I didn't wear them to work. Because when I went out, I wanted to change and I wanted to look 
different. That is what I'm saying about clothing that's uh, so refreshing is that if you've had a bad day or you've had bad news or you're kind of low in your uh, self-esteem, they call it, you can always dress, wear a dress or change your clothes and uh, can change the outlook a little bit. And if you'll do that instead of eating ice cream, <laughs> you'll be better off because, uh, especially if you sew, you'll have a new dress. What makes no sense during a day of work, let's see. Laura I. Balt wrote that evening wears free us of broken lines and curves, repetition of pattern and design. But what makes no sense during a day of work, because it would get in the way. So your evening wear would get in the way. There's just a little bit more fluff and frills and drapiness to the evening wear. For women who worked as maids and wore uniforms or other plain and practical clothes during the day, changing for the evening was a special pleasure. Okay, so I'm going to go on to something else now that I've read that. And I wanted to remind you when I talk about Molly, in Wives and Daughters, and I have been talking to you about young girls at home, and I guess I guess I want to call it the truth, the harm of going to work outside of the home, and I wanted to show you a couple of places that you could find out more about this, and then I will um, read this. Now, I get this from a little phrase in Titus 2, verse 5, that talks about how the older women are teach the younger women to be keepers at home. And I was talking to somebody the other day who was objecting to it and going off on all kinds of tangents about it. And I said, well, why is it in there? And how close can we get to it? Can we try it? Can we see if it will work? But what people do, I, I notice, is they'll look at the culture. And it doesn't seem to match up with the culture, so they don't have the determination to follow it. And when, when they try it, they'll like, well, I'll just try it for a while, but they don't like it. Um, it's different than having a heart for it. But I wanted to show you a couple of movies that you can get. One of them was Wives and Daughters. I don't think anyone in here was actually portrayed as working outside of the home in a, a job maybe mentioned but Emma I believe in Emma I believe it was the 1995 edition Mr. Knightley made some kind of snide remark about uh, how the um, governess industry took advantage of young women and was not not good for them at all and uh, of course it was just more getting young people away from their parents and out of the home. And in general, people uh, sent their daughters to work if there was no provider. If there was no father, uh, there was no brother, there was no grandfather, there was no husband, there was no one that could help them. And of course we know, uh, according to the story of Ruth, that the uh, women of that religion did not have to work because the fields were left with some grain that these women could pick up. And uh, that wasn't considered work. It was just considering, considered just getting uh, gleaning. Well, here's another, here's another beautiful movie that you could get called Princess Cut. And if you follow this story and this girl all through it, you'll see that she only time she worked uh, outside the home was with the whole family when they were harvesting their own field. But you know harvest isn't forever. It's just a week or so, a couple of weeks. It doesn't take long. Uh, and I've seen them across the field here take off a crop in a day. So, And, and the women will come and bring uh, their food. But uh, it's not like it's a career or anything. But she uh, was within the, within the care and protection of her own family. And uh, so I would really suggest you watch this because I don't think any of the women in here, in this movie here, Princess Cut, uh, were portrayed as uh, having jobs other than their home life. And of course, it's all farm-based. Uh, and they had plenty of time to uh, do charity, bake and cook for others, 
uh, take others into their home um, and help on the farm. And the other one I wanted to remind you of is this one here. I don't have the actual uh, picture, the whole picture, but it was called North and South. Remember that? Mr. Thornton and uh, Margaret there. This is the Elizabeth Gaskell collection. But there it is, North and South. Now what's interesting about that is that it was about the factories in the north of London. Uh, the fabric, fa clothing, fa wasn't clothing, but they, they made uh, cotton. And, and in these factories, guess who they were hiring to work in these factories? Single women and children. And so they were getting sick. They were getting what's called cotton lung, where they cough a lot. And uh, it was a serious disease, and many of them died. But they were getting the single women outside of the, out of, away from their homes to do this. And in, the, in this collection here, the Elizabeth Gaskell collection, there's several stories that she wrote in here that are now movies. But this man here... Uh, trying to think what his name was, who played John Thornton. He was interviewed uh, on this little part, this one CD that, uh, DVD that was an extra, and he was interviewed about how did he um, find out during uh, uh, what, what kind of things were going on at the time in the world and how these factories were run and who was in them and what the purpose was. And he had to read Marx and Engels, you know, Marx apparently wrote the uh, Communist Manifesto. And one of the things, if you look up all the quotes by Karl Marx, uh, this was one of the, his targets was to get these women, before they were even married, working in these factories. And uh, working outside of the home, people will say that, oh, these girls will, you know, they'll meet someone and they'll get married. Well, they used to. They, they didn't take it so seriously. But working outside of the home is not wise. And those of you who have done it will, can tell all kinds of problems with it. And I wanted to read from my mystery book here. <laughs> uh, I don't tell you the authors sometimes because you set up a prejudice against them for whatever region, reason. Maybe, they were, maybe it was a different religion or it was uh, the occupation that they held or anything like that and uh, fail to see the truth that they told in some things, even though they didn't, uh, you didn't agree with them on uh, other things. So I want to read to you about the man's responsibility. And I think that the men get left out. The young men get left out. And I also will read to you about uh, what's being said in some of these older books. And this book was written around approximately 1960. Um, but... I'm so glad it was because it records how we used to feel, and uh, it's amazing. Let us examine, it's called the man's capacity to provide. And of course, in the 60s, there was a great sort of social upheaval, and all the magazines and newspapers were uh, talking about women's liberation. But as Taylor Caldwell said in her little booklet that I read to you called Women's Lib, uh, it was for the men to liberate them from having to look after women. Let us examine how God has prepared man to meet his responsibility to provide. His preparation includes, includes physical, emotional, and temporal, temperamental qualifications. A man who has preserved the body God has given him is a perfect specimen for his work. He has a strong body which functions beautifully under normal strain. To see a man at his work, his muscles flexing in beautiful coordination is to see the handiwork of God. He has physical endurance, taking day in and day out toil which extends for a lifetime. He enjoys the flexing of muscles and the habit of work. And talking about the habit of work, I'm reminded that we are best at what we uh, participate in. If we have a habit of waking up in the morning and worrying, then that's, your mind is just going to feed that worry all the time. So what we have to do is break that by starting a new habit. 
And so if you wake up in the morning in fear and dread and worry, and uh, you, you can just feel the cortisol mounting up, then you need to start substituting a habit for that. Uh, get up and do something that is nice, that is friendly, that you look forward to, that relieves you. And if it's, if it's wholesome and good and lovely, just keep doing it till you feel better. And I can say that I have found several exercises that have helped me a lot to get uh, away from tension. And there was one day a couple years ago when there was some bad news or something had happened to someone else and I just could not, I just could not relax. I could hardly breathe. And I found an exercise on YouTube and I started doing, it was for um, anxiety and rest and other things. And I thought this isn't going to do me any good, but I started doing it. And then I would get up and do something else and that, then I'd feel that awful anxiety again and so I do the exercise again by the end of the day I had forgotten where the uh, anxiety stopped and the happiness began I just kept doing this over and over and I looked back and all my work was done and I get up and you know do something else and pretty soon I was able to balance that so that the, the thoughts were still there and the situation had not changed it had not um, straightened out and we ladies you know We'll be happy when everybody behaves, won't we? We'll be happy when everyone starts living right. Uh, and so this this really did help. And we don't do ourselves or anyone else any good if we destroy ourselves, if we allow our health to uh, deteriorate. That has to be a priority. And remember, Brian Kozlowski had that wonderful chapter in his book, The Jane Austen Diet, called the mind-body connection. That is just so helpful. And God knew it was a mind-body connection because he wrote so much about it. Philippians 4.8. Um, think on things that are good, lovely, and true because he knew that you can't function uh, any other way. You can't even do good works unless you have that mind of uh, goodness and loveliness. And I do think, since I've read so much about dressing up, that that helps a lot. That helps the mind a lot. That is not something covered in some of these Jane Austen books. That's probably something that needs to be addressed. He is blessed with the emotional makeup to endure the demands of his work. This is going somewhere. The stresses and strains of the marketplace, the roar of industry, the uncertainties of the crops in the field, and the financial challenges of the office. He can endure worry and has the capacity to overcome obstacles, solve problems, and succeed at his work. I may have explained this to you before. Yes, anything a man can do, a woman can do. But her capacity for enduring the stress is going to be different. And she's going to take it in to her mind and body in a different way. And uh, it's similar to, in a man, he uh, spends his life thinking about how he's going to provide, how he's going to keep up his uh, lifestyle, his payments, and keep a roof over everybody's head. And he thinks about it all the time. And even when he's on vacation, he's thinking about maybe a second plan in case uh, his, his job uh, fades away. You know, sometimes these companies don't stay in business. And he's thinking about it all the time. And modern people tend to just say, oh, you know, that's too much stress for the man. Let's, let's send the woman to work, too. Um, but it's like this. And I've shown this to you before, kids. I'll just do it again. This is the, uh, what you call the dishonorable or stronger vessel. And it's a tin cup. It gets a lot of dings in it. It can fall on the ground. It can go uh, to work. Uh, you can s sit outside, put it on a piece of concrete while you're drinking out of it, uh, and you can use it again and again, and it survives the stress. It survives, it survives the stress of using it and working with it. This is the weaker vessel. It is more refined, and when we talk about refinement, it doesn't mean that it's not strong, but it won't withstand this, the kind of stress this will withstand, and it's, it's more refined, and it can take hot water. These can last 100 years. 
Uh, in fact, these eventually will get holes in them, and, uh, but they are very, very useful while they're being used. And these can last a long time if they're used properly. If they're not put out there and used in the great outdoors, and we don't normally go camping with them, um, if they're used properly, they will last a long time. And uh, they will serve the beverage, and it will taste good. And they just have a refining, uh, they're just more refined. And that's what the weaker vessel of the woman is called, the recal vessel, not because she's, um, she'll break up easily, but because she's more refined. And it's, this, is, this is used for every day, and this would be used for something special. And so I wanted to show you an illustration that I have had over the years when I had these classes for young girls. Uh, I'm not sure that they, it had much of an effect on anybody, but I did my best. This is crude oil. Remember, I got it because there was a time when the men used to change the oil uh, in the car, and uh, they'd have a little drip pan there laying on the ground, and they could. And they also had a can, you know, and you open it, and that's why I saved some crude oil. That's what crude oil looks like. It's very, very dark, and. Uh, this is refined oil. It's like, uh, I forget what they would call it, but it's more refined. In other words, it's been put through lots of filters and sifted and till you get this kind of oil. And it's used for lotions and perfumes and other things. I'm not promoting petroleum <laughs> as ideal, but you can see the difference between the crude and the refined. And while uh, we expect men to be a little more crude because they're hardy and tough and the work they do, uh, the women are not expected to be. They're expected to be more refined. And that's why I show you these things and try to warn the young girls about getting started working outside the home. Because here's the problem. Where do married women get the idea uh, and the habit to work outside the home after they're married and even after they have kids? when they're single. And the single, just like this man was talking about, these factories back in the 1800s, uh, they were um, occupied by the single women. I really advise you go to Freebie. You can uh, download that for free on your phone from Amazon. And uh, they have movies and they have North and South on there. And I will try to get a picture of that so you'll know what to look for and uh, put that on the page where I've embedded this video. And uh, so I will continue, and I hope that the lesson is, the lesson about these two things are, is clear to you. Uh, one is the woman and one is the man is what it's trying to say. And I did show this to some young men. See, the young men get left out of these lessons. We teach the young women to be refined, and we teach them uh, the difference between masculine and feminine. But the young men get left out of that. Uh, it's natural for a young man to be masculine. But the young women have to be taught uh, to grow into grace and graciousness and, uh, and good behavior for women. And uh, you won't find uh, a young man protesting all these scriptures that talk about uh, providing for their own. They don't argue about it. But you'll find a young woman when the, the scripture says, be a keeper at home, uh, trying to get around and around and around it. And she'll go on and on and on about how Deborah was a judge and Lydia was the seller of purple. And uh, But they forget about other people that sometimes this is how uh, the, the surname, how we got our surnames was Simon the Tanner. Alexander the coppersmith, uh, and uh, Lydia the seller of purple, Deborah the judge. It was to identify them from separate in part, maybe from others. And if you go back to, they always like to dredge up Deborah or the Proverbs 31 woman, but if you go back to Deborah, she wasn't praised by God for being a judge. She was praised for what she was doing uh, for the armies of Barak. And uh, also, there were other people that were praised. Uh, let's look at, but but even the Proverbs 31 woman, she wasn't praised because she 
uh, she sold something or she bought land and she sold it, she was praised because of her uh, respect for the Lord. And also, if uh, God was promoting women to be uh, career women, why would uh, harlot, the harlot Rahab have been found favor with God? Well, because of what she did for the Lord. And I don't know if people are looking at that, but they're always looking at these, trying to find a career, you know, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But uh, what they did uh, for the cause of Christ and the cause of God was what they were being praised for, not because they had a particular career. And a lot of these careers are just identifying marks, too. For example, Alexander the Coppersmith and Simon the Tanner, the young men don't go around saying, oh, I should be a tanner. I should be a coppersmith. There wouldn't be anything wrong with it, but they get the message. Somehow the young girls have a, a, a block there. And uh, so I'll continue reading about the men. He is a competitive in temperament, a characteristic fitting him to gain his place in the world. He is aggressive, decisive, and possesses the qualities necessary to deal with the perplexing problems in a challenging world. Yes, and many of us who were married in the 1960s and 1970s and our parents who were married in the 1940s, uh, the men were always looking for their options should this job end, like some of our jobs were seasonal, should this job end, uh, they're thinking about the next one. They're thinking where they can go next. And uh, because that was their whole life is to, and also it wasn't like they were working and it was just a drag and everything. They were learning new things. They were learning to build roads. They were learning to work on the highways. They were learning to fish. They were learning to um, construct things. And uh, so they had a whole lot of experience and new skills. And they could build houses. And it wasn't like, you know, they just had to go to work. Um, but they also always were looking for a substitute in case this, this didn't go through. or they, Because they knew that they had, even without uh, a family, a man had to take care of himself, maybe even his mother. But it would have been a, a, a shame for him not to be working. And the men would say, well, if I can't stay with this job, I'll, I'll get a temporary job. I'll, I'll pump gas. They all said that, didn't they? And I've, I've known women whose husbands became, uh, this is interesting, uh, there was a man whose company he knows he knew was not going to last. And so he got a part-time job in the meantime with a moving company. And what did that teach him? That taught him how to pack things so that the uh, possessor, the person who was, those possessions did not get damaged because the company would be fined or sued even if uh, precious antiques furniture was damaged so he learned how to pack and you know when you get one of these u-hauls a lot of people just throw stuff in there take it and then everything's damaged by the time they get it to their new place there's a little sheet that comes in there that you read that tells you that the washer and dryer go over here near the cab and how to balance it and how do you have to have these uh, blankets and things to coat everything so they won't rub against each other so he got a job with a moving company and he got new skills and during the times when his family had to move from place to place, they never lost one item. Not one broken thing ever arrived. And uh, then there was uh, a woman that told me her husband got a job, a part-time job, uh, because she, uh, he did not want his wife out working. He got a part-time job working for a company that cleaned carpets in people's homes. And he learned so much about that and about cleaning carpets and carpeting and different things like that. So, uh, and then there was another uh, man that got a job with flooring, installing flooring in someone's house. And this, these were just part-time jobs, but they were collecting information all the time they were doing this. Now, you could say, well, a woman can do that. Well, of course she can. But she was, like I said, built for other things. And she can take the strain and stress of a new baby, 
of teaching children at home, of taking care of a house, and it's a different kind of stress. Yes, it can get pretty powerful sometimes, uh, but a man, on the other hand, has a different kind of stress. And they're both uh, equal, but different. There are, of course, many men who succumb to the pressures of the working world. Statistics point out that the competitive business world is killing our men since his life expectancy is less than a female. His arduous lifestyle is said to be destroying him. But men do not die so much because of their work as because of other things. Faulty diet, little exercise, use of drugs, alcohol, and tobacco all take a toll. Frustrations caused by emotional turmoil, misunderstandings, and unreasonableness, and bringing discord to the home can cause strain. Bad habits and unrepented sins create serious debilitation. Further frustrations occur because he has not understood his rightful place in the home and, and the consequences of off-balance behavior. He may be working too hard and too long and providing luxuries. This emphasis on superficial values does not bring the internal, internal satisfaction expected. Hard work is usually an advantage, but misdirected hard work is destructive. Any normal man who has properly cared for his body and is in good health has the capacity to provide the necessities of life with reasonable ease. In addition, he will have a reserve capacity, allowing for extra responsibilities beyond his home, as well as time for personal interests. God has blessed him with a greater capacity than most of us suppose. So I'm going to end there because I've already been here over time. And I hope, ladies, that this has been helpful. I do appreciate your comments. I would like to come every single day. I'm always trying to work on how do they do that. How do they do that? I, look, I watch YouTube videos. I see people posting them every day. And it's exciting to see them. It's something nice to listen to. So, ladies, I hope that you will go to the link and see what else I have put up there. I'll put the dress that I'm wearing and a few other links. And... Uh, what was that I was telling you, that a link that I was going to provide for you. I'll find that for you. And Oh, I know what it was. I'm going to give you the link to the uh, page that a lady has on the clothing of wives and daughters. And she has also uh, screenshots of some of these dresses that I have sketched here. And, you know, these would be uh, appropriate for wearing at home if they are the right, uh, you know, silhouette and length and and not too much extra on them. So I'm going to give that a try. And I want to thank you all for coming. And I love you. And I hope you will stay close to Christ. And I hope this has been helpful. And that you're doing well in your present circumstances. And that you have great plans for improvement. I'll talk to you later. Bye.